I quote Shukriyaya. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We say Shukriyaya to you because you are worthy of all our praise. Now, at this time, Father, I just want to give myself to you. And I elect myself to give your people's minds and their hearts to you. Take full control of my mind, of my heart, of my lips. I pray that you take full control of everyone here, that your message will come true. It's not a presentation, it's not a sermon. This is sharing what you have told me. And so, Father, I ask that the message will come home, and it will hit home hard and true. Because when the world is said and done, we don't want to come here and go home and be the same. We want transformation, not modification. We want transformation, Father. So we ask that you take time now and go with us. In the name we pray, amen. 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 It is good to be able to share what God has given. And the message which I'm going to share has really, really challenged me. But it has also blessed me in a really, really significant way. And so I pray that you guys will also be blessed and be challenged. Because at the end of the day, like I said in my prayer, I don't want this to be another day when we come to church and we go home exactly the same. So I pray that you give me your mind and your heart. And yet it is. To know and to abide in Jesus. That's what it's all about. Over the course of the last 10, 10 months or so, God has taken me on this journey and I'm still on this journey. And my heart is stirred within me so much so that I want everyone here, and in fact everyone in the world, to join me on this same journey. And all that journey is about is this, to know and to abide in Jesus. The text pretty much said it all. It said that, and this is eternal life. This is it. We are all here because we want eternal life. And Jesus gives us the solution, he gives us the answer, he says, to know him, to know God, and to know Jesus, whom he has sent. This is eternal life. I'm going to give you an outline of where we're going, and so that hopefully no one will fall asleep. But in case you do, you know what the message is all about. Essentially, it's not what you do, but who you know. And who you know will change what you do. What you do will then be this simple word, is this word? Perfect. To abide, to dwell, to live with constantly. When you abide, you will not sin anymore. Hopefully that sounds controversial. When you abide, you will have full assurance of salvation. When you abide, you will not sin. You will have full assurance of salvation. Why? Because righteousness is something that you will receive from Jesus is not something that you achieve. This is what has been challenging me so much over the last 10 months, and I feel privileged to share it. First section of the message is called Rasta. It's who you know that really, really, really counts. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, it's not what you do, what you do. but who you know. Change what you do. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, most of us have a behavior and performance oriented walk. We have a performance and behavior orientation to our Christian walk. Essentially, if I ask you what is a Christian, most of us would define it in the context of what you do. Most people say a Christian is someone who is nice, a Christian is someone who is honest, a Christian is someone who goes to church, a Christian is someone who X, Y, and Z. However, this is not biblical. Christianity is not defined in the context of what you do. Christianity should be, and biblically, is defined in the context of who you know. We say that we believe that we're saved by grace through faith. But if we are honest with ourselves, if we check ourselves, we will really, really come to believe and to see that we actually believe that we're saved by our works. Isaiah 64 verse 6, Romans 3, 20. 
There are quite a few texts. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm not going to ask you to flip through all of them. But I'm praying that somebody will be challenged. Somebody will be provoked by this message. And they'll come up to me afterwards and say, but Manny, you share with me that sermon outline, and I'll freely and happily share it with you. These texts teach us that all that we can do, all that we can muster, before God is but filthy rags. That's why Isaiah 54, 6 says. Romans 3, 20 says that, by the deed of the law, shall no face be justified. Well, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says that, we're saved by grace through faith. True or false? If, and I want you to vote, if you end up in heaven, it will not be because of what you've done. True or false? True, put your hand up. Okay, I see maybe about five hands out of 300 which are working. Let me ask you again. True or false? If this statement is true, put your hand up. If you end up in heaven, it will not be because of what you have done. True, put your hand up. Okay, a few more hands are working. I'm surprised. Okay. Same kind of situation. I want you to vote. If somebody ends up not being saved, if somebody ends up lost, it will not be because of the bad they have done. Let me repeat that question. If somebody is lost, it will not be because of the bad thing they have done. If that's in the street, put your hand up. Okay. Even less hands have gone up. You guys can't see. I wish you could see what I can see. But in the first vote, eventually get about 15 hands went up. In the second vote, about six went up. And this proves my point, that our understanding of salvation is shaky. Our understanding of salvation is not well founded. And this is what I want to spend a little bit of time on today to talk about and to share. I will ask you to turn in the Bibles to 1 John 5. 1 John 5, verse 12 and verse 13. If you're there, say amen. I heard one or two amen. If you're there, say amen. amen. I'm going to be hanging around in 1 John. So put a bookmark, put, some, put something, the bulletin, in around 1 John 3. And we hang around there. This is what 1 John 5, verse 12 says. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Verse 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. When um, I first came to this country, within about six months, I figured out that this country works very much like my own country, Ghana, back home, in the sense that it's who you know that really counts in this country. There came a time when um, my wife and I wanted to renew her uh, Qatar ID. And a colleague of mine had told me that he had been trying to do the same for his wife for about six months and still no avail. He ended up having to give someone a little backhand up, same in the UK, about 6,000 way out to try and get this thing going. And still, it was still stuck in the system. And so he advised me that if I know him on that, he helped me, I should try. And by God's grace, I knew somebody who knew somebody. And so I asked that somebody, and by God's grace, the system worked relatively well with little hiccups. That, in Qatar, they call Wasta. And believe it or not, it's the same kind of context with our spiritual walk. It's a case of who we know, not what we do. Jesus shared a few parables, and I want us to flip to these and we can see for ourselves. If we go to Matthew 7, Matthew 7, 21, I'm going to read to verse 23. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Amen. Okay. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Sounds pretty normal by Adventist. He does the will of my Father. Okay, verse 22. 
Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Turn a punch, verse 23. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness? Wait a second. Did Jesus just not say in verse 21 that he who does the will of my Father? These people just said they cast out demons in Jesus' name. I remember there was a time when back in the UK, I was driving home from work, and a friend called me and said, Man, there's a situation. Uh, there's a lady who feels that there's an evil spirit in the house. Can you join me to come and pray? Go to that house. And as it happened, I had literally just gone past that house. I said, Lord have mercy. I turned the car around, and I met up with my friend, and we went there. And that drive between, it was about five minutes from where I was to the house. Believe me, I prayed like I've never prayed before. Because I had the idea that we're going to go and deal with the devil. We're going to go and encounter the devil. And here we have people who said they have actually cast out demons. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You were practicing iniquity. Iniquity is sin. Turn with me. Luke 13, there's a first cousin of this same parable. Luke 13, Luke 13, 24 to 27. Remember where we're going. It's not what you do, it's who you know. Luke 13, 24, 27. Make it with me, say amen. amen. Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, as that word again, many, I said to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Verse 26. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But I tell you, I will say, but he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, there it is again, all you workers of iniquity. These people said, Lord, we ate and we drank with you. We had communion with you on a regular basis, once every quarter at least. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. So what is the message Jesus is trying to say here? It's a case of who you know. And what did our scripture text say? John 17, 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you and your son who you have sent. A couple of interesting points John have when I read those things, those parables. Number one, the fact that it says many, many. When I used to read Matthew 7, 23, it used to scare me. There's a sermon I heard that said four words, four words that will jam hell. I never knew you. And indeed, I always used to shake a little bit because I wasn't sure if I really knew Jesus or if he really knew me. But now, by God's grace, throughout this journey that I've been taken, I now feel that I do know him and I'm getting to know him. Amen. The word know in the Greek is genosko. Everyone speak a bit of Greek. Say this is old Greek. Say genosko. Okay, to know. Okay? To know. And it means to have an intimate relationship, to have a deep intimate knowledge of somebody based on a two-way relationship. The Jewish people use that word to describe the relation between a man and a woman, if you know what I mean. Matthew 1.25, it says that Joseph did not get lost Mary until she had given birth to Jesus. So to know means an intimate connection. The parable of the ten virgins is another one. Because the time I, want us, I don't want to go there and explain it too much. But many of us know that the parable of the ten virgins, finally Jesus came. So ten people were actively looking for and waiting for Jesus. I feel pretty confident that everyone here would say that they are actively looking for and waiting for Jesus to come. Is that true? Yes. So this is the ten virgins, so we can all pass ourselves amongst them. 
And yet when the bridegroom, when Jesus finally came, five of them went out to go and get some extra oil. That's one aspect of the uh, parable. But the parable, the heart and the core of the parable is this. They came back. So it wasn't an issue of time per se. They came back and they knocked at the door. And Jesus said what? I don't know you. I don't know you. And he says the same thing again. Get away from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so hopefully the message is getting there now. I don't want to repeat myself too many times. But the Bible is clear. It's not a case of what you do. I don't get me wrong, what you do doesn't matter. I'm going to come up to that. But it's not a case of what you do. It's a case of who you know. Has everyone got that now? Okay. Isaiah 29, 13 says that these people, and like I said, because of time, I've been told already that I've only got until 5 past 12. And so, like I said, by God's grace, someone will ask me afterwards, and I will share these sermon outlines with you. Isaiah 29, 13 says that these people draw near to me with their lip in their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. And then he goes on to say that they only know me based on what other people have told them about me. They don't know me for themselves. How many of us are in that situation where we know God or we know of God or we know about God based on what other people have told us about God? Other people's testimonies, other people's Bible studies, other people's experiences, but we don't have some for ourselves. Okay, I will use my power. If it works, then yeah. Okay, that would make sense. This is for me now. We do want to Okay, again. <clears throat> The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that a mere assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. In all human experience, a theoretical knowledge of the truth has been proved to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. If you know Jesus up here, but you don't know him here, you don't know him in your heart, it's insufficient for the saving of your soul. A jealous regard for what is termed theological truth often accompanies a hatred of genuine truth as made manifest in their life. The darkest chapters of of history have the darkest chapters of history are burdened with the record of crimes committed by bigoted religions. This is the reason why we cannot define Christianity by what you do. Because if we look in man's history, we will find that the darkest points in history have been times when so-called religious people have done and committed the worst atrocities we can think of. The very people who crucified my Lord and Savior, the very people that crucified him were supposed to be the people who knew him the most. John 5.39 says that you search the scriptures because in them you thought you could find light. So they knew their stuff, but they nailed him to the cross and went home Friday evening to have vessel with their families to get ready for Sabbath the next day. So just knowing God up here is not what really counts. It's having that relationship with Him. There's a term that says that lowercase truth, you can search the scriptures all you like, but you can gain information. That's lowercase truth. Jesus says that He is the truth. So He is uppercase truth. He is the way He is the life. So, if I'm not saying that is what you do, what am I saying? What is the point? What I'm saying is that it's who you know, not what you do. But I didn't stop there. I said that who you know will change what you do. In my first life, I said that what you do will then become abiding. You will then abide. I like object lessons, so we're gonna take part in an object lesson. And I want everyone to take part in this, okay? I would like you to stand up if you feel quite confident that between now and 10 p.m. tonight you will have something to eat and something to drink. Please stand up. Or else. (laughs) Okay, thank you. Take a seat. Now, Try this again. I'd like you to stand up 
that with the same level of confidence that you just expressed in your ability to have a meal or your likelihood to have a meal, if you believe that between now and 10 p.m., if Jesus was to come, that he would definitely take you with him. Stand up. Thank you. That's my point. Why did we not all stand up? More of us had assurance and trust and confidence that we would have something to eat than we had in Jesus Christ taking us with him. But all he's done in this Bible, from Genesis, he came looking for Adam and Eve. In Revelation, he's standing knocking at the door saying, Manny, I want you. I'm looking for you. I'm desperately hungry for you. I love you with all of my heart and I want you to be with me. That's all the Bible has been saying. And yet we still don't trust him. We still don't have assurance. I like to propose that the reason why we lack assurance, the reason why we lack confidence, is because there is some stuff which has been misunderstood in our Christian experience. We have misunderstood certain things. Number one of which is what we've just been speaking about. We believe, we say we believe, we're saved by grace, but we have just proved, I can not prove it, we have just proved that we don't believe that. We believe that we're saved by our works. But there's a problem. When you believe that you're saved by your works, you don't have assurance. You do not have assurance because you're trusting in yourself. And most of us know ourselves that we fail and we flop and we fail and we flop time and time again. It seems like we are like students who have sat an exam and are just, you know, fingers crossed, legs crossed, everything crossed, just praying and hoping that when the results come out, you would have done okay. If you know what the examiner wants, and you know how to give the examiner what he wants, then you go and do that. Come results day, you'll be chilling, you'll be like, yeah man, come results day, I'm okay. I know that I have done well, I know that I've passed, because I knew what was wanted, and I knew how to give what was wanted, and by God's grace, I practiced it, and I did that. So come results day, I feel confident, I have full assurance. Remember I said, when you abide, when you know Jesus, you will abide. When you abide, you will not sin, number one, and you will have full assurance, number two. Now very, very quickly, 10 minutes, wow. I'm very, very quickly gonna try and show you that. I'm gonna try and see what I can leave out so that the, the essence can be still getting. All right, now let's do this. Let's define sin, and let's define lawlessness. If I was to say to you group of Christians, what is sin? What is sin? What would you guys say? Give me a text that comes to mind. Most of us would say sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. But is it really? Or have we understood that the way the Bible actually means? The word for sin is hamateno or hamartia. The word for transgressing the law is anomia. Both of them, when you dig into it, mean walking away from God's given law. Both of them mean, mean walking away from God's given law. I want to try something, Brother Harvey and your girls. Can you please come up with me? Very, very quickly. Okay. Let us imagine. Can I have one here, you in the middle, and one on the other side? Fantastic. Let us imagine she is God. All right? So, let us imagine that this beautiful young lady here is God. Let us imagine that our Harvey is love. Let us imagine this beautiful lady here on the other side is law. Okay? So we have God, we have love, and we have law. 
God love law. Now, for time's sake, just believe me that these Bible references are true, and I want you to go check it out afterwards. Okay, so, Matthew 22. Somebody comes up to Jesus and says, what is the most important thing in the scriptures? What is the most important thing in the law? Jesus says that to love God and to love your neighbor. To love God and to love your neighbor. So Jesus defined the law as love. Is everyone okay with that? Yes. Okay. If I was to say to you, if I was to ask you, who is God or what is God? Most of you would say God is love. Okay, so God is love. So we have God is love. And we have Okay, we have a bit confused here. We said before that she was God, yes? Okay, and we said he was love. Okay, and we said that this was law. So the Bible just said is that law is essentially what? Love. God is essentially what? Okay. If this young lady there is love, Law is love. God is love. God must also be, therefore, equal to law. Hopefully, you can see in reality that God and law are actually the same thing. <laughs> Just have a look at that for a second. Hopefully, you can see the kid. If the law is love, that's what the Bible says. And if God is love, that's what the Bible says, then God must also be equal to law. Sin and lawlessness are actually the same thing. Thank you. Sin and lawlessness are actually the same thing. In the Bible, sin is actually departing away from God. Because 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is lawlessness. So, if God and law are the same thing, if lawlessness is sin, godlessness must also be sin. Is that with me? Yes. Oh, that's not too deep. Still 12 o'clock. So, we must change our understanding of what sin is. Sin is not the thing that you do, the misdeeds. Let me get that clear, because my time is almost up. But if you don't get anything else, sin is not the thing that you do, the misdeeds. Sin is actually being away from God. Sin is that divide. Isaiah 59 says that it is your sin that separates. We have misunderstood lowercase sin, which is the thing that we do, with uppercase sin, which is the separation. What actually is true is that the separation is what leads to the, the thing that you do. Is everyone with me? Is that when you have a mechanical device and it's not connected properly, it's going to falter. Is everyone clear? This is the reason why we sin in our traditional definition of sin. But I want you guys to leave this place knowing that my real sin, the real issue is my separation from God. So if that's an issue, what's the solution? I got to get with God. Early on today, Elder Harvey showed us in practical terms. And last night, Brother Maiden began the series. This whole part, this weekend, is a series. And in fact, the three of us are trying to cram about 13 sermons into about one and a half. So therefore, we're not going to get everything. So by God's grace, we will have more time later on. Or we're going to try and form a small group that is going to radically change the way we think about God. That by God's grace, through practical tools, such as soap, like Earl Harvey shared, we are actually going to get to know Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Is everyone with me? Yeah. Like five minutes to round it up. Right. When you know Jesus, like it is your privilege to do so, you're just going to abide with him. You're just going to be connected to him. When you're connected to him, you will not sin because sin is separation. So when you're together with God, you're not separated. Most of us think of God as somebody who's sitting up there ready to punish you and take you to hell or send you to hell if you sin. When in fact, going to hell is just your choice because you have gone away from life. 
that God is life and you walk away from life, what do you have? Death. It's not God punishing you, it's just the natural result of what you have chosen to do. Is that one prayer? When you abide, you will no longer sin because sin is being away from God. So abiding is not sinning. When you abide, you will have full assurance of salvation. I'm going to take two Bible texts and I'm going to show you that salvation and righteousness is something that we receive. It's not something that we achieve. Okay? Yes. We have tried to achieve. I have tried to achieve. I've gritted my, my, my teeth. I've put my foot down. This time, God, I'm not going to mess up. This time, God, I'm not going to fail you. But never tell you what happens. I flop. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah, uh, I think it is 13, 23. Jeremiah 13, 23 says that a leopard can't change its spots. Psalm 51, verse 4. I am born and shaped in iniquity. This thing is inside me. It's endemic. No matter what I do, it's inside me. So I have a heart problem. Therefore, I need a heart solution. Is everyone with me? This is the reason why righteousness and salvation is something that I receive. I don't achieve it in and of myself. I receive it, it is a free gift. The Bible says in Ezekiel 36 that 36 verse 24 down. God says that I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. This is where I really want you to focus. Then God says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Thank you, God. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ways, in my statutes. Philippians says that it is he who works in you both to will and to do of his uh, pleasure. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave, you, uh, gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Amen. Let's go to the next slide. I just want to hit the message home and I'm out of here. I want you to count. Okay, this, this is fine. In the original, I highlighted none of that. I'm going to read, okay, the eye from the back, you probably can't see it. In my original, I highlighted it because I want you to see how many times God says I. I'm going to read it, see if you can count. Behold, I will gather them out of all nations where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in my wrath. I will bring them back to this place. Thank you. I see this. This is working. And I will cause them to dwell safely. Verse 38. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever, for, for the good of them and for their children. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, so that they will not depart from me. Yes. I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assure them upon them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. Right. This is what the Bible says. So why have we got it twisted? Why do we think that it is us who has to manufacture righteousness? We say we believe that we're saved by grace, we're forgiven by God. But then as soon as we say we believe or uh, we've been forgiven, Somehow something twigs in my head and we think, okay, thank you Jesus for giving me, for forgiving me. I'm now going to do good and show you that I'm, I'm thankful for what you've done. And Jesus says, listen, behavior and performance matter so much. I don't want anyone to leave this place with the wrong message. I'm not saying that how you live does not matter. It most definitely matters. It matters so much that Jesus will not trust you with it. He says, Give it to me. I will do it. So what am I saying that you've got nothing to do? No, sir. You definitely have something to do. Now we will go into the last slide. Essentially, what you have to do is to surrender and say, God, here I am. Take me. Messed up, filthy, poor and wretched, naked as I am. Take me. I surrender. And work in me. The Bible says that we are his workmanship. Philippians 1 6 says that he who begun the work will finish it. He is the author, he is the finisher, not us. Okay? 
what we must do is look at the uplifted Christ on the cross. How do we do that? We can do that in very practical ways. I'm not here to say, look at Jesus, come to the fountain of life. Very airy fairy things that you can't tangibilize. What I'm saying is, you've got to pray. Don't pray like God is Father Christmas or the head of Walmart that you take him, you take to him your, your shopping list. Okay? You've got to pray. Pray for the specific purpose of communion with him. Then you must study. And then there are some practical tools, and if you see Brother Hardy myself, Brother Vaden, who will share with you these practical tools, how to pray. You've got to study. Study to get to know the ruler, not the rules. Read the Bible to find the man Jesus. He is there all over the shop. Read the Bible to get to know the ruler, not the rules. Lastly, you've got to share. The dead sea is dead because of the sea, and it never gives out. You must share. Now, I feel like I've gone like a million miles, but I kind of had to because unfortunately, we only have 35 minutes to share the word. So, this is a, a sample. This is a small snippet of what God has been challenging me with, challenging what I've been with, uh, hard with over the last couple of months. And what we want to do is, we want to change. We don't want status quo. We don't want to keep coming to church and leaving church, come to church, leaving church the same way and there's no change. The reason why there hasn't been any change, the reason why most people here do not stand up with full assurance to say that when God comes, by His grace, I believe He's going to take me, is because we have got this understanding all wrong. We don't know Jesus. So, I'm going to make an altar call for two things. Number one, when we bow our heads and close our eyes. So no one's looking. This is time for you to really think about what we're talking about today. Number one, if you want to get to know the ruler, if you want to get to know the ruler, you already know the rules. If you want to get to know the ruler, if you really want to have a personal relationship with Jesus, I ask you to stand up and to come forward. That's the first call. Number two, if you want to join a small group that has not started yet, but I believe by faith it will start. And this small group will specifically exist simply for the purpose of getting to know Jesus using these practical tools. I'd like you to stand up and come forward. Two auto points. If you want to get to know Jesus properly, if you want to join a small group that is all about getting to know Jesus properly, come forward. Let us pray and let us ask God to take full charge. Those of you who do come forward, I'd like you to see myself, but the baby, but the hobby briefly after church. So we can bring the numbers and we can talk about how we can actually begin this process of really getting to know Jesus, like it is our privilege. Those who have not come forward, I respect you. I respect you for being honest and being where you are. Don't come up just because the crowd has come up. Come up because you want to know Jesus. Come up because when we do begin to get the small group together, all these small groups together, they're going to be there by God's grace because you just want to be your small part, which is just a surrender. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Holy Spirit, thank you so much for giving me the short opportunity to, to, to share some of what you have given me. And I know that I haven't shared everything, but I believe that the message has hit home. And I ask that what hasn't hit home, you will take it home. Father, you see your people. I am the chiefest of sinners, and I'm saying, Lord, I want to get to know you. I'm tired of just being the same old man. I want to be man in the fullest that you have planned for me. And I believe everyone who stood up here is saying exactly the same. They want to be all that they can be for you. They want to know you as much as it is their capacity to know you. Father, please, Holy Spirit, do your thing. I don't even have the words right now, but I'm just asking that you take the heart and you take the mind and that you will transform. You will do for us what we said in Ezekiel 36. You will create in us a clean heart, a new heart and a new spirit, Father. Please, we want to get to know you. Time is wrapping up. We're not going to be here on this earth much longer. So, Father, please, make it real for us. We ask that you forgive us of our sins 
and those who are seated, Holy Spirit, I pray that you continue to blow upon their heart and blow upon their mind to the point where they too will come and say, I just want to get to know you. How do I get to know you? Give me some practical tools that I can use to get to know you. So Father, please, forgive me for my shortcomings. And I ask that you take me and you take all these people who are still up here, that we will truly get to know you. <clears throat> it is eternal life to you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us be seated. Please remember, let's try and get together after service to talk about our next steps. Amen and amen.
pray that you take this message and that you continue to use it to work upon all our hearts and minds. That you bring us to the place where we truly do know you that is our place. Where we have joyful, happy, jubilant, passionate Christian lives. Where you do change us so that these small things that we do day to day, these sins that we commit, they will not be a part of us anymore because the ultimate sin of not abiding will not be in us. We will, we will love to abide with you. So Father, please just take this message and use it. Please forgive us and go with us. And bring us back again in prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen.